Thank you, Mary. All right. What I'd like to speak about this afternoon is to provide you with a historical and geographical overview of the Bible. It's important for us as Catholics that we know our faith, know enough about our faith and the foundations of our faith that when we're challenged, and I think most of us are challenged uh, quite often by people who don't understand Catholicism. When someone comes into my store, for instance, and they'll say, well, I'd like to buy a Bible, I'd say, well, what kind of a Bible would you like? And invariably, uh, if someone would say, well, I'd like a King James version of the Bible, I would then ask, well, why would you want an incomplete Bible? And they usually say, well, what do you mean? How is the King James version of the Bible incomplete? And then that gives me an opportunity to share with them the foundations of Catholicism, what we believe, why we believe it. So it's incumbent upon us as Catholics to have that, that foundation, that intellectual foundation, so that we know in our heart that the Catholic Church teaches the truth, and that even though we can't always articulate or explain the truth to others, we'll know that it teaches truth, and therefore when we're challenged, there's no thought of, of, of leaving the faith, or there's less confusion. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more this evening when I speak about the Jehovah's Witnesses because that's one of the things that happens with the Jehovah's Witnesses is that they will set, uh, sow seeds of confusion. But that's another topic. So let's talk about this one. What we're talking about here is where the Bible came from, why there's a difference between the Catholic Bible and the Protestant Bible. And what I'm going to do is give you a very detailed overview of history, beginning with the patriarchs of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now this happened about, well, let's see, we're talking about 18, 1700 to 1800 years before Christ. Now you remember the story of the patriarchs and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Jacob had 12 sons, one of whom was named Joseph. And Joseph was the youngest son, and he was the fairest of them all. And the father doted on Joseph. So as a result of that, Jealousy raised its ugly head in the family. I'm sure you're familiar with the story. Joseph is eventually sold into slavery. The brothers think about killing him, but then they decide not to do so. So they sell him into slavery to a passing caravan that happens to be going to Egypt. When he gets to Egypt, Joseph is sold at the slave market. And a man who was head of the Pharaoh's army named Potiphar purchased Joseph. And Joseph was a very, very bright young man. He was well-educated for the time. And he was put in charge of Potiphar's household. Well, it turned out that Potiphar's wife took a shine to Joseph because, as I mentioned, he was a very comely young man. So she hits up on Joseph. Joseph rebuffs her. And so she goes to her husband, and she complains about Joseph, and she accuses him of something that Joseph didn't do. So Joseph is eventually thrown out of the house and he's actually thrown in prison. And while he's in prison, he meets two of Pharaoh's men who have fallen out of favor. One is a baker and the other one is a butler of Pharaoh. And these butler, the butler has a dream and the baker has a dream and Joseph interprets the dream. And in one of them, the butler is to be restored to his prominence in the household, but the baker is going to be put to death. And that transpires and within three days, the butler is back into the home of Pharaoh. So Joseph tells him, you remind, re, think of me when you go back to Pharaoh's house. So the butler does, and he tells Pharaoh this story, but Pharaoh also has a dream that he can't interpret. So he brings David, or, or rather uh, Joseph in, and Joseph interprets the dream. And in the dream, it, there's going to be in Egypt seven years of abundance. And then there's going to be seven years of famine. So uh, the Pharaoh is so taken with Joseph that he makes him the governor of all Egypt. And anything and everything has to flow through Joseph. And it comes to pass, in the seven years of plenty, they store up the grain. Seven years of famine. Well, it wasn't just famine in Egypt. It was famine in the whole area. So it went all the way into Palestine where Joseph's family lived. So Jacob sends 10 of his sons to Egypt to buy grain. And there they meet Joseph. And Joseph recognizes his brothers, but they don't recognize him. But he doesn't uh, uh, have any ill will towards them because 
Joseph believes that this was God's will. It was God's divine providence that brought him to where he was in this situation. So he eventually embraces his brothers and he says, you go back to my father and you bring my father here. And that came to pass. So approximately 70 people in the household of Jacob went from Palestine into Egypt. Now they were in Egypt for 430 years. Joseph had given them the prime land. It was called the land of Goshen. That's the land of milk and honey. He gave the, his family the best of everything. So over a period of 430 years, the, they multiplied to the point where the book of Numbers says that when Moses led them out of Egypt, there were over 600,000 Jews. 600,000 Hebrews were freed from captivity. Next comes in this series of events, the whole idea of Moses. And you know that Moses was God's anointed one who went in and he, he argued with Pharaoh and Pharaoh told him that uh, he, you know, he wasn't going to let the people go. The people had grown to such numbers that they became a real threat to the sovereignty of Egypt because they had, since they had the best of everything, they began to, the Hebrews began to control Egypt. And when we remember the story about all the, all the, young, uh, the young boys being slaughtered by Pharaoh, well, the purpose of this was that the women, as they grew, would not have men to marry. They would have to marry Egyptians, and eventually all of the lands and property would be restored to, to Egypt. So Israel became an oppressed nation where the, the, the children, the little children were slaughtered. So Moses comes and he brings them out of Egypt. And I'm not going to belabor you with all of that story. But essentially what happens in the this, in this scheme of events is when uh, Moses gets to Mount Sinai. And there it says that God spoke to Moses, that, that, that Moses heard the voice of God. And he received not only the Ten Commandments, but it's believed in this 40-year exodus that he also received the Torah. And the Torah is the first five books of the Bible, or also called the Pentateuch. Moses left Egypt somewhere around 1280 to 1230 BC. So for the next 250 to 300 years, it was just a cycle of wars and peace and war and peace until the time of Solomon. And Solomon reigned from, King Solomon reigned from 967 to 928. Now Solomon had 700 wives and he had 300 concubines. So with all of these women to take care of, this was a very confused man. So what he began to do was, in order to satisfy the, the women that he had married, he began to build foreign temples within his, his kingdom. So it, was, it got to the point where the alien, there were alien rites instituted in the temple in Jerusalem. So we had not only things like ritual prostitution, but we had foreign gods in the temple. This went on for a number, for the period of about 100 years, where not only was, was Solomon involved, he was the first one, then his son was named Manasseh. And Manasseh was considered to be one of the worst of all of the Hebrew kings. Because what he did was he tried to expunge the name of God from the Torah. And he also continued these pagan sacrifices, especially one to a god that they called Moloch. And Moloch was, uh, and it actually tells us in scriptures, uses Moloch's name, that it was forbidden for the Israelites to offer sacrifice to Moloch. Because what it was, was outside, a little southeast of Jerusalem, was a valley called the Valley of Ben-Hinnom. And Ben means son of, so it was the valley of the son of Hinnom. And this had become a place of defilement. In Jesus' time, when Jesus talks about hell, he uses the term Gehenna. And this term Gehenna actually comes from Gi Ben Hinnom. Because this valley southeast of Jerusalem was where the god Moloch was worshipped. And it depended on, the, the god itself was in the form of a... Uh, um, like a calf with the arms I'd stretched like this. And it was a human head, it had a human head, and, uh, or excuse me, the head of a calf with the arms outstretched, and the body was hollow. And in the body they filled it with wood, and then they lit the wood on fire. So the arms had become, would become red hot. And they had seven fences, and depended on what you brought 
to sacrifice depended on how close to the god you could get. And the first one, if you brought just a fowl, a bird of some sort, then you could go into the first, first gate. If you brought a goat, you could go through the second gate and be that much closer to the god. If you brought a sheep, you could go to the third gate. And if you brought a calf, you could go to the fourth gate. And if you bought uh, a cow, you could go to the fifth gate. And if you brought an oxen, you could go to the sixth gate. But if you brought your own child to be offered in sacrifice, then you could go right up to the God itself, and there you would place, place the infant child on the red-hot arms of this God, and that's the way they sacrificed to this God. So this went on and, uh, for, like I said, a hundred years. The third son involved in all of this was named Amon, and Amon too decided that uh, he wanted to destroy all of the scrolls so that there would be no reference to God, and it was completely pagan. Josiah is the next one in line. Now, Josiah begins to try to bring things back together, but after so many years of profanation of the temple, the God had sent prophets in, one prophet after another, and they killed the prophets. So finally, God, essentially you could say that this was a straw that broke the camel's back, but God finally got pretty fed up with the whole thing. So in 597, God allowed Israel Palestine to be invaded and Jerusalem to be invaded by Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. And it says that the temple was destroyed, we know historically, in 586. So at that time, 586, we've lost the temple that Solomon had built. Almost the entire population of Jerusalem was then sent into slavery. Scripture tells us in 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Chronicles that a small remnant was left behind to till the land, it says specifically vine dressers and farmers. But the vast majority of population went into captivity in Babylon. And you've got to understand Babylon at that time, because Babylon was a city that had four-story buildings. It was set before between the Tigris and the Euphrates River, and they used this, the water from those rivers to irrigate the land. It was the most prosperous. They had dead straight streets. They had libraries. It was the cosmopolitan area. It was the greatest, the greatest city in the world at the time. So the Jews, were, they were brought in, and they were allowed freedom to worship as they wanted. But when the Bible talks about, in the book of Revelation, it talks about the whore of Babylon. This is a reference to this period of history when the Jews were in captivity in Babylon because they had, again, ritual prostitution. And every woman had to prostitute herself in the temples at, at least once in her lifetime. And they were essentially, there were hundreds and hundreds of altars and, and pagan, uh, pagan shrines throughout the, the city of Babylon. So, the key person here involved in this period of time is Ezekiel. Now, Ezekiel was captured in 597 when the first invasion of, of Israel took place. So he began later to bring back the, the love of God within the, the people of Hebrew, the Hebrew people in Babylon. And the people were in captivity for 70 years. And the life expectancy of an individual at that time in history was 40 years. When the Bible talks about a generation, it literally means 40 years because that's approximately how long people live. It's estimated that less than 2% of the population lived beyond 50 years. So if the, his, the Israelites were in captivity for 70 years, you can assume that probably all of them, or at least the vast majority of them, died in captivity. And you know as well as I do that when people come into America, for instance, and they're immigrants, and maybe they speak French or they speak Spanish or whatever the language is, within a generation, those children become acclimated to, to the language of the people in that area. So when the, when the Hebrews left Jeru Jerusalem and Palestine, they were Hebrew speaking. But the language of the world at that time was Greek, and the language of Babylon was Greek. So at the end of 70 years in captivity, Scripture tells us that Cyrus, the king of Persia, came into Babylon and he freed the Jews and he allowed them to take everything back, all of the things that were stolen from the temple, he allowed them to take that back so that these things could be, uh, they could develop another, uh, uh, another worship site and so forth in Jerusalem. So here we have approximately 50,000 people. This is the remnant that is left in Judaism. 
50,000 people leave Babylon. Many of the people stayed there because they were very prosperous. Even though there was, there was some slight persecution, it was still a place where they could be free and they, they controlled a lot of the wealth of the area and so forth. So when they went back from Babylon, it's 430 miles from Babylon to, uh, to uh, Jerusalem. When they got to Jerusalem in that whole area, it was desolate. That it, for years and years, all of the farms were, you know, everything went back to nature, if you will. So there was nothing there. And for years, there was famine among the Jews. So many of them left Jerusalem, many of these 40,000, and they went to Alexandria, Egypt, because Alexandria, Egypt was a place that welcomed everybody. There was freedom of religion there. The people who remained in Jerusalem simply, in 539, they erected an altar stone. And in 536, they began to offer sacrifice again. Actually, it wasn't in 539, it was in 536. They, they established an altar stone and they began their worship and their sacrifices to God. They began to rebuild a temple in 520. Now, this was a very abbreviated temple because it only took them five years to build it. So in 515 BC, the second temple was erected in its miniature form, if you will, and then it continued to be added to over the generations. But the key here is what happened in Alexandria, Egypt. By the time of Alexander, and he died in 323, the largest population of Jews in the world were in Alexandria, Egypt. It's estimated that there were a minimum of a million Jews living there. The second largest population was in Rome, and then Jerusalem was the third largest population. But these were Greek-speaking Jews. When Alexander died in 323, his empire was divided up while on his deathbed among six of his favorite friends, his best friends. They began to argue among themselves just sl slightly after Alexander died. And eventually there were wars and, and so forth for over 20 years. And by the time we get down to about 300, 301, there are only three kingdoms left out of all that Alexander had built, that whole, and that was essentially the known world. And we had the Macedonian kingdom, the Seleucid uh, kingdom, and then it was called the Ptolemaic dynasty. And the Ptolemaic di dynasty was in Egypt. And there were 15 Ptolemaic pharaohs who ruled up until the time of Cleopatra, about 200 years, 15 pharaohs. Now the first pharaoh was called Ptolemy Soter, and Soter meant savior. And then his son was called Ptolemy Philadelphus. And Ptolemy Philadelphus wanted to have Alexandria to be the greatest learning center in the world. And they had a series of buildings, a collection of buildings, I would say, that were called the Museon, or in English you would say it was the House of Muses. And they had classrooms and study halls and libraries, and they had two libraries. One was called the Bruchion, and the Bruchion was the main library where scholars would come from all over the world. They had about 90,000 books, and then they had another 400,000 scrolls, that had more than one book on them. So this was the greatest library that existed in the known world. And then outside of the library, they had a place called the Serifium. And the Serifium was where the common people could come and they could study. And it had about 50,000 scrolls. But the only thing that they didn't have was the Hebrew, the Torah. They didn't have the Bible. And since they wanted this library to be the greatest library in the world, they said, well, how can we go ahead and get the Torah? So there's a letter called the Letter of Aristeus. And some people say this is not true, this is, it never really happened. But most people believe that it did happen. And in this Letter of Aristeus, it describes that Ptolemy Philadelphus had a librarian named Demetrius of Phaleron. And Demetrius contacted Jerusalem, and he asked the, the Sanhedrin, the governing body in Jerusalem, to send them six scholars six rabbis, each from the 12 tribes of Israel. And supposedly this came to pass. And the legend then gets pretty esoteric about how the translation was completed. But essentially, by, they began a translation of the Torah from the Hebrew into Greek. And that translation began, began to be known as the Septuagint. And the word Septuagint means from the 70. 
Now there's two reasons for it. One, it's believed that the number of the 72 rabbis, but also this, the Sanhedrin was also six rabbis or, or six, uh, six authorities, if you will, from each of the 12 tribes. So the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem numbered 72. So scholars are kind of torn between, well, was it named Septuagint because of the 72 scholars or the 72 in the Sanhedrin, but it doesn't really matter. So what we have here, by the, the beginning of 200, about approximately 250 BC, the Torah has been translated into English. And over the years, the other books of the Bible were then translated, did I say English? Were you listening? Did I say English? Oh, I thought I said that it was translated into English. What tra yeah, I did. Okay, she was listening. You get a gold star. Okay, it was translated into Greek. So by a hundred years before Christ, the entire Bible as we know it today as Catholics, the Old Testament, had been translated into Greek. So we have the, how do we know that, you know, when we say, well, Jesus used the Septuagint. The apostles used the Septuagint. How do we know? Well, there are 300 direct quotations in the New Testament from the Greek, from the Septuagint. Matthew himself, in his gospel, quotes the Old Testament 130 times. And scholars know, because of their, you know, the knowledge of different languages, that this tra these translations came from the Greek rather than from the Hebrew Bible. So we go along from the time of the... Uh, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem until the time of Alexander Janaeus. And Alexander Janaeus lived, let me get the, the date, because I always forget this date. Alexander Janaeus ruled uh, Israel or Jerusalem from 103 to 76 BC. Now, Alexander Janaeus was the first king since the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, and he just simply crowned himself king. And he was also the high priest, but he was hated by a great deal, a great numbers of the people because he not only assumed the authority of the high priest, but he also married someone who had been uh, a widow. And that was forbidden under Jewish law for a priest to marry a widow. So this man was, was uh, not very well respected. As a matter of fact, he was hated. He was a, a Sadducee. And the, they had three religious groups, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the Essenes. Now the Essenes lived, and I'm sure you've heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls. They lived in the area just east of the Dead Sea in the Qumran area and where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in 1946 to 1957. Well, the Essenes were, they were also called the penitents. It's believed that John the Baptist was more than likely an Essene, that he came from out of the desert. And when the Bible talks about out of the desert, that's the period or the area of the country that they're speaking of. But there are also the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Now, the Sadducees believed in the literal translation of the Torah. No more, no less. We're going to follow the law very, very specifically. But the Pharisees said, well, this is a guideline, and we can extrapolate from there. So they began to use the Torah and the Scriptures more as a, almost like a social gospel. They try to use the scriptures to answer all of the questions that, come, that might come out in, in daily life. So the Sadducees and the Pharisees hated each other. Alexander Janaeus was a Sadducee, and he had an absolute vengeance against the, the Pharisees. But when he died in 67, his wife, Alexander Salome, took over, and she ruled until 63 B.C., she eventually turned the authority over to the Pharisees. And the Pharisees took vengeance on the Sadducees. And there were approximately 50,000 Jews died in this war between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And this went on for a number of years. Until we come, when, when she died, she had two sons, Aristobulus II and Hyrcanus II. Hyrcanus II was the, um, the high priest. And both of these brothers started this fraternal war. They, each one of them wanted to be the boss. So what they did in order to settle this is neither one of them had power enough to gain control over the other. So in, 60, in uh, 63 BC, they actually invited the Romans to occupy Jerusalem. 
they submitted their argument to one of the generals called Pompey, and, they, and he decided over Hyrcanus because he was the more pliable of the two. So most people don't realize that the Jews were, they just simply invited the Romans in. Well, the Romans began to, uh, by 6 BC, they established procurators. And these were the ruling authority over the people at that time. And about that same period of time, up rose a group of people called the Zealots. And the Zealots literally hated the Romans. And this went on for years. They said, no God but Yahweh, no tax but the temple, and no friend but another Jew. And this was their motto. And they, they just, uh, they were constantly like guerrilla fighters going after, after the Romans. Now we know that Jesus died approximately the year 33. We know that he was about 33 years old when he died. It is said that Jesus was born during the time of the reign of Herod. Now we know that Herod died 4 BC. So when we speak about Jesus and dying approximately 33, we can say that Jesus probably died around 29 or 30 AD. The New Testament began to be written shortly after Jesus' death. In the year 70 AD, there was the destruction of the Second Temple. Now, Jesus died approximately 40 years before the destruction of the Second Temple. And again, 40 years is a generation. Now, what happened when in 70 AD? Number one, the temple was destroyed. All of the priests were killed. Now, they weren't killed by the Romans. They were killed by their own people. They had such hatred for the priesthood at that time that the Jews rose up against the priesthood and wiped them all out. So we have no sacrificial priesthood. When the temple burned, all of the Levitical records were burned. So there's no way that anyone today could stand up and say, I'm the Messiah because you can trace my lineage all the way back because there are no more records. Now what happened here? We, from a Christian perspective, Jesus died in, we'll say 30, the temple's destroyed in 70. In other words, Jesus gave us gave them, the people at that time, a generation in which to accept him as the Messiah. There were many signs, portents to the Jews that, would, that they began to understand that the temple was going to be destroyed. At the same time Jesus died, certain things happened that were just uh, frankly extraordinary. There was no way, the, Jews, the, the Jewish leadership knew that the temple was going to be destroyed. One of the signs was this. On Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the Jews would offer sacrifices. The high priest would go into the Holy of Holies five times on Yom Kippur. He also, ten times outside of the Holy of Holies, offered sacrifice. And one of the sacrifices that they did was, uh, they, they heard the, the term scapegoat. Well, they had two lambs that they, would, that they would sacrifice. And what they did was they put a scarlet ribbon around the necks of the lambs. One lamb was driven into the wilderness and eventually over a cliff to die. But the other lamb was sacrificed in the temple. But they put a scarlet ribbon around their neck. And the scarlet ribbons every year were turned from scarlet to white. And they believed that that was the, the signification that signified that God was pleased with the sacrifice of these lambs. Also, the doors of the temple took 20 men to open and shut the doors, and they would seal the door with this scarlet ribbon. Well, the year that Jesus died, the scarlet ribbons never turned white. And the, the leadership, the high priest, knew that this was a sign that God had rejected their sacrifice. This had never happened before. In addition to that, in the middle of the night, the temple doors opened by themselves. In the temple doors, it took 20 men to open or shut the doors. But, and they were bolted into the ground. During the middle of the night, the doors opened by themselves. And the high priest knew that this was a sign that the temple would be destroyed. And 70, 40 years later, a generation in which God gave them to accept his son as the Messiah, and then he shut the door, and the temple was destroyed, and the sacrifices wiped out. So what was left now for the Jews? They were only the authority that they had were called the rabbis, which means teacher. So 
this was the beginning of the dispersion of the Jews, where they just, there was a price on their head in, in, in Jerusalem, in Palestine. So Jews just spread out all over the place. And the authority that was left, the rabbis, went to a small town about 12 miles south of present-day Tel Aviv. It was called Javna, or Jamnia. And they began to try to pull the remnants of Judaism back together. And they established a school of authority called the Bet Din, and where they could, uh, again, teach Judaism. Well, you Christians were a real pain in their backsides because you were using the Bible to show the prefigurement of Jesus, that there are 300 prophecies in the Old Testament that, about the Messiah, and Jesus filled all of them. Now, what are the odds that he would have fulfilled 10 of these prophecies? But Jesus fulfilled all of these prophecies. But the Jews resented this because they felt that they were, the Christians were using their own book against them. So they decided that they were going to put together their own canon of Scripture. And they had four basic criteria. They said, first of all, we're only going to accept books that are written in Palestine. We're only going to accept books that are written in the Hebrew language. We're only going to accept books that are written that conform to the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. And fourthly, Jews believed that God stopped speaking to them as a nation with the death of the last prophet, and that was Ezra somewhere between 400 and 450 BC. So they used that as an arbitrary cutoff. And they said, that's it. Anything written from the time of Ezra to their time, which was in the latter part of the first century, would have been eliminated. So that eliminated seven books. Now this Bible had been formulated, but it wasn't what we would call canonized. In other words, it wasn't set in stone by the 100 years before Christ. But again, there's ample evidence, and scholar after scholar after scholar, whether Catholic, Protestant, or Jew, would recognize that the Septuagint was the Bible of the early Christian church. And I'd like to read just a couple of quotes to substantiate that. Now, this quote comes from the Jewish Encyclopedia. It's called the Encyclopedia Judaica, and it is published in Israel. And it says, quote, together with the New Testament, the Septuagint constituted the Bible of the Christian Church, and it is still the Bible of the Greek Orthodox Church. The Old Testament contains a translation of all of the books of the Hebrew canon. It also embodies the deuterocanonical books of the Catholic Church. Now, when we talk about deuterocanonical versus protocanonical, deuterocanonical, deutero means second. So we're talking about the second canon. It doesn't mean that these books have a lesser stature within the canon of Scripture, only that these books were established as canonical at a later date. A lot of people don't realize that some of the New Testament books are proto-canonical and deuterocanonical. For instance, the letter of Paul to the Hebrews wasn't actually established as Scripture until about 380 A.D. So that's an example of a deuterocanonical. So we have, this is, this is what, what this means. Secondarily, the Tanakh, which is the actual Jewish Bible that's published today, says, quote, with the growth of Christianity in the first century, the church adopted the Septuagint as its Bible, and the Septuagint was translated into the language of various Christian communities. Another one is to show you from a Protestant perspective. This is F.F. F. Bruce, and he's one of the leading Protestant scholars and he says, quote, there were two main reasons why the Jews lost interest in the Septuagint. One was that from the first century A.D. onwards, the Christians adopted it as their version of the Old Testament and used it freely in the propagation and defense of the Christian faith. And finally, one more from Nelson's Bible Dictionary, which is again a non-Catholic source, quote, when Christianity penetrated the world of the Greek-speaking Jews and then of the Gentiles, the Septuagint was the Bible used for preaching the gospel. Most of the Old Testament quotations in the New Testament are taken from the Greek Bible. In fact, the Christians adopted the Septuagint so wholeheartedly that the Jewish people lost interest in it. They produced other Greek versions that did not lend themselves so easily to Christian interpretation. The Septuagint thus became the authorized version of the early Gentile churches. To this day, it is the official version of the Old Testament used in the Greek Orthodox Church. After the books of the New Testament were written and accepted by the early church, they were added to the Old Testament Septuagint to form the complete Greek version of the Bible. So here we have Protestant Jewish 
Catholic sources all readily admitting that the Bible of the early Christian church was the Septuagint. Why is that important? It contained 46 books. Now sometimes if you do some study in apologetics or history, you'll see uh, 42 books or you'll see 22 books, depending upon the numbering. Some reduced it down to 24 books. Another group would reduce it down to 22 books. But what you find is that these numbers are compilations. But essentially, the Bible of the early Christian church was identical to the Bible that we have right now. So the next thing that happens is the New Testament. The New Testament was formulated by Catholic bishops over approximately a 26-year period. In 393, there was the Council of Hippo in North Africa. This is at the time of Augustine, and he was very active in this particular council. Then there was also the councils, the fourth and fifth councils of Carthage. That was in uh, 397 and 419. So it took 26 years for the leaders of the Catholic Church to establish what books belong in the New Testament. You see, it wasn't just 27 books like we have now. There were actually at the time almost 50 Gospels. There were 22 books called the Acts of something. There was the Acts of Thomas and the Acts of Philip and the Acts of Peter and everybody wanted to get into the Act. All right. Forget it. All right, just seeing if you're listening again. All right, so anyway, here we have, and now there's also Gnostic writings. Gnostics were a group of people who said that they had a, a specific, intimate uh, understanding, and it was a, like a secret society, and you had to be initiated, and then they would give you secret knowledge. Well, a lot of these Gnostic writings were floating around, and there was a great deal of confusion as to what books really belong in the Bible. So the Holy Spirit used the authority of these bishops. Now, these bishops were, in the councils of Hippo and Carthage, established Established that 27 books and 27 books only were divinely inspired. What criteria did they use? Essentially, the criteria was twofold. First of all, can we trace these books to an apostle? And if there was a direct connection, they said there was no question, essentially. These were divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit and they were incorporated in the Bible. But all of the other books that they had to keep in mind there was no real direct communication. Letters might have taken months or even years to get from one person to another. Many times, you know, letters were lost and so forth. So it took them a great deal of time to determine whether or not these books coincided and conformed to the oral teachings of the apostles. And we're going to talk about that in, in the next presentation. What we're talking about here is the sake, what we call sacred tradition, the oral teaching of the apostles. But it wasn't just the oral teachings as well. Now, to give you an example, we have four Gospels, right? We have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But only Matthew and John were apostles. Mark and Luke never met Jesus, and they never heard Jesus speak. So logically, you would think, well, why are these books in the Bible? There's no direct connection to our Lord. But yet, Matthew, or excuse me, uh, Mark was the secretary and the traveling companion and interpreter for Peter. And wherever Peter went, Mark went with him. And he translated, Mark could not, or Peter could not speak Greek, so Mark translated for him. And then Luke traveled with St. Paul in the same way. So the Christian community came to Mark and Luke and said, write down what you hear from the mouth of an apostle. It wasn't that these things weren't written down, it was just that they weren't written down necessarily by an apostle, but they were written down by the men who were taught by the apostles. So the church over this 26 year period formulated the New Testament. And that testament was called the African Code. Keep in mind this was in North Africa where this was put together. And the African Code contained 27 books. Now non-Catholics will many times point out that the councils of Hippo and Carthage were not ecumenical councils, therefore they didn't count. Now what's the difference here? An ecumenical council is when all of the bishops in the world come together with the Pope as the head and they define some particular piece of work or doctrine. Well this, this African code was a local council and therefore Protestants will say that the authority was negated because it wasn't a, an ecumenical council. So next what we have is in the Second Council of Nicaea in 787 ratified the African Code, and that was an ecumenical council. 
So in other words, in 787, in Second Nicaea, the Bible was codified firmly, this is our Bible. It was the first time an ecumenical council established that. And then that went on from 787 to the Council of Florence in 1442, which reiterated the same thing. And then finally, after the Protestant Reformation, we had the Council of Trent. So why all the difference now between the Catholic Bible and the Protestant Bible? We went around from 497 to five, uh, four, 400, 397 to 419, we now have the Bible as it exists today. And we go along for 1,100 years and there's no problem. Everybody's using a Bible identical, all Christians are using a Bible identical to the, the canon of Scripture that we have today. But then we have Martin Luther come on the scene. Martin Luther, as you know, started the Protestant Reformation. Now, a lot of times we're told, well, it was because the Catholic Church was selling indulgences. Have you ever heard that? And that's the reason why? Well, let me tell you, that's not the reason why the Protestant Reformation was started. That was the excuse that was used to, you know, to begin the Protestant Reformation. But the Protestant Reformation was actually began many years before that time in a period that dealt with let me see if I can find it here. I want to give you the, the dates. All right. The first of all was the Avignon Papacy. In 1307, the Pope was elected from France, and he didn't like to be in Italy, so he moved the Papacy, and after a few years of being an itinerant Pope, literally going from town to town, and I believe it was 1304, he established the papacy in Avignon, France. And it was there for 70 years. This was a time when the church lost its authority. St. Catherine of Siena eventually goes to the Pope who's reigning at that time. I believe it was the third Pope that, that was residing in Avignon. And she says, if you don't go back to Italy, I'm gonna tell God on you. So he's eventually, he goes back to Italy and, and resides in Rome. And a few years after he, died, he went back to Rome, he died. So what happens is they elect another pope, as they normally would. Well, the people in France didn't like the person that they elected as pope, so they elected what we call an anti-pope. And this went on for a period of years. And then also in Pisa in Italy, a, a second anti-pope was elected. So from 1378 to 1447, they were anti-popes as well as the one true pope. And the average Christian didn't know who was pope. And the people in, uh, in France mounted armies against Rome, and Rome again mounted armies against the Avignon papacy, and they were wars, and Catholics were fighting wars. And the average person who was the farmer out in the field could have cared less. They didn't know who was the true pope, and the authority of the Vatican was tremendously diminished at that time. Secondly was the Black Death, the Black Plague. The Black Plague came out in 1348 and lasted for 30 months. And it started in the Crimea and went down and swept down through North Africa. All of Europe was taken into consideration and all the way up into even as far as Greenland. And it's estimated at that time that 25 million people died of the Black Plague. And we're talking about roughly 25% uh, of the population of Europe died during this time. Now, who do you think took care of these plague victims? Who were the most knowledgeable? They were the priests, the monks, the nuns. And the Black Plague reoccurred eight times from 1450 to 1500. So it was the priests that were out there trying to minister to the needs of the people. There was starvation. This is when the Europe began to fractionalize, where different groups of people met and coalesced together, and they started what we now know as Germany and France, and all of these countries began to grow, and people began to you know, be with like people to protect themselves. So we're talking about, in France specifically, in Europe, Entire monasteries were wiped out. 
They, they ended up losing 300 men of the Curia in Avignon, France at the time. But hundreds and hundreds of thousands of, of religious people died. It could easily be estimated, now I've never honestly seen figures on this, but it could easily be estimated that 90% of the Catholic clergy in Europe died during this period of the Black Plague. So what was left for the church? First of all, those that were left were the most educated. They didn't have seminaries the way they did now, the way they do now. And each priest or each person that wanted to become a priest would go and attach himself to an abbot in a monastery and they would be trained. So we, we've, the, the priesthood is decimated. Those that were left that were educated were put to work by the secular authorities. There's a lot of people looking for jobs at the time too, and there's a lot of great deal of starvation going on. So many people, the church just simply started taking in people and ordaining them as priests when they probably shouldn't have, because some of them didn't have the right motivation. But they felt that they had a need to meet people, you know, to meet a needs of people that had to be met. So they began to bring in people in the clergy that shouldn't have been. So this was a time when the quality, not all of the clergy, not only a priest but bishops, were in many cases less to be desired. And it was a time of great deal of, uh, of, of upheaval. And then finally, the third cause of the Protestant Reformation was Pope Leo X. Now, Pope Leo X was actually a lay person who was ordained uh, to the priesthood and to the papacy in 1513, and uh, he died in 1521. Now, if he was one of the Medici family, and the first thing he said to his brother was, let us enjoy what God has given us. And within two years, he had emptied all of the papal coffers. All of the money was gone. So in order to raise money, he established the indulgence. Now the indulgence was never meant to be sold at all. That's not what indulgences are all about. I wish I had time to go into that all in more depth, but I'm afraid I don't. But essentially, he sent people out because he wanted to raise money, not only to fill the coffers, but also they were building St. Peter's. They were working on St. Peter's and he needed money for that. So he offered an indulgence. And essentially what he was saying is, if you will donate money to the rebuilding of St. Peter's, I will offer you an indulgence. I must admit at the time, the doctrine of the indulgences wasn't as clarified as it is today in Catholic doctrine. So there was a great deal of confusion. But if I paid somebody to go out and preach the indulgence and I gave them a percentage of the take, and this is essentially what happened. And some of the people would go into the German princes and say, well, I'd like to preach the indulgence in your province. And the, the prince would say, well, what's in it for me? So they were getting a cut. The people who were preaching the indulgence were getting the cut. So they were beginning to misrepresent what the indulgence was all about. That's the key that Luther, that was the straw that broke the camel's back that enabled Luther to break away from the church. But essentially, Luther was not a very well-educated man when he was ordained. He only had about nine months of Catholic theology before he was ordained. He was an ultra-scrupulous person. He believed that God was a God of vengeance, and he feared God. He was so afraid that when he said his first Mass, he had to be restrained from leaving the altar and he actually collapsed behind the altar because he was terrified that if he did anything wrong at the altar, God would strike him down right there. That's the kind of mentality that he had. So he looked at God, it was the God, not of the New Testament if you will, but it was the God of the Old Testament, a very vengeful God, and Luther feared him. So Luther began to develop a, th a theology that was quite new in, in Catholic circles. He first of all, he started studying scripture and he decided that God had preordained certain people to go to heaven and others to go to hell. The doctrine is called predestination. Now, God, once God establishes and says that you're going to go to heaven and you're going to go to hell, God doesn't change his mind. So he said, well, how would you know if you're one of the elect? How would you know if you're the one that has been saved by God? And he said in John 3, 5, where Jesus says to Nicodemus, he said, Nicodemus, you've got to be born again. And Nicodemus says, well, how do I get back in the womb of my mother? And Jesus chastises him and says, you know, you're a man of the law. You're, you're a man. You should understand this. And Jesus goes on and says that you must be born from above by water and the Spirit. Now, every commentary that had ever been written up until the time of the Protestant Reformation says that here Jesus was speaking about baptism. Titus 3.5 says we're saved through the washing of regeneration, that we're saved through baptism. What washing regenerates us? 
For centuries, the entire lifespan of the church, it was baptism. So the, and, and Galatians 4 and 5 tells us that through baptism, we become sons and daughters of God. And we're entitled to God's inheritance, which is eternal life. So as Catholics, we believe that our baptismal gift from God is eternal life. You can't earn, etern you can't earn a gift. This is a free gift. The Council of Trent in the sixth session of the Council of Trent on Justification in 1545 specifically condemns the idea that anyone can work their way into heaven. Heaven is a free gift that we receive when we're baptized and we become sons and daughters of God. Luther said, no way, no way. He said, John 3, 5 means accepting Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Now, if you verbalize that, if you said, I accept Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior, you couldn't have done that without the power of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, you knew that just verbalizing this, that you were saved. And God is not a God of confusion, and God doesn't change his mind. So by saying, I accept Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior, I'm saved, and I can't lose my salvation. And he said, you could go out and commit murder and fornication a thousand times a day, and you would not lose your salvation. He said, sin and sin boldly, but believe more boldly. As long as you believe, that's all that was necessary. The doctrine of faith alone. And what did this do? What did this do in Germany? After a while, it destroyed, literally destroyed, the moral fiber of the country. And wherever Protestantism swept from Germany into France and Switzerland and England and all over, even to America, what's happened is this Protestant gospel that all I have to do is accept Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior has destroyed our moral fiber. And Luther, Calvin, Swingley, all of the so-called reformers all wrote at the end of their life my gosh, essentially, I'm paraphrasing, what have we done? We've taken away the accountability for sin, so everybody is sinning, and especially the clergy. They wrote that the clergy in Europe were more corrupt under Protestantism than they ever were under Catholicism. At least in Catholicism, there was accountability for sin. And that Protestant ethic and that Protestant gospel has spread to right today, we're living in a country today that is essentially Protestant. We have, I don't know how many million people in this country, but they estimate that 100 million have no religious affiliation whatsoever. I think we have like 235 million people in this country, and, and I may be off a bit. But 100 million have no religious affiliation. We have another 20 million who rarely darken the door of a church, and we have another 20 million fallen away Catholics. So in other words, more than one out of two of our population have no religious foundation whatsoever. And we wonder why we're aborting a million and a half babies and why our elderly people are being put to death now in Oregon. That's what's happened when we say, well, Jesus did it all and his sacrifice on the cross is all that was necessary. We are accountable before God. So Luther says, essentially, we're not accountable. He denied free will. Now, the doctrine of free will, the fight, the, the, one of the best uh, scriptural references is called the book of Sirach. Now, the book of Sirach, chapter 15, verses 11 through 20, tells us that we have free will, that God is not the author of our sin. We are the author of our sin, that we have free will. Now, the book of Sirach was also called Ecclesiasticus, and the word Ecclesiasticus means the book of the church. Now, why was this book called the book of the church? Because in early Christian days, in the time of the apostles, this book was the most used book in the proselytizing of the, of the uh, pagans and the, the Greeks. Because this book was the one that was used more in training and catechesis of the early Christians. So, this sticks in Luther's craw. He can't just take out Sirach. Now, the second thing Luther talked about was that if you accept Jesus, you go to heaven, and if you don't, you go to hell. Well, where does this whole doctrine of purgatory come in? Now, the church has been teaching the doctrine of purgatory for 2,000 years. But let me tell you, folks, it was 2,000 years before that. In other words, the doctrine of purgatory goes so far back into antiquity, we don't know where the idea of prayer for the dead stemmed from. We have no origins. We can't go back that far. But the Jews believed, if you look in any uh, Jewish encyclopedia today, and you look up the word hell, it'll have little equal signs and say purgatory. The whole doctrine of purgatory goes back 4,000 years. See, Jews, you ever remember the term seventh heaven? Yeah, 
Some of you with gray hair say, what does that mean? What does it mean when someone's in seventh heaven? Do you remember? All right. It means they're really happy, right? They were joyously happy. Well, why? Where did that come from? Well, the Jews believed that there were seven levels of heaven. And each level of heaven had a specific purpose. But the seventh level of heaven was where the throne of God was. So if you were in the seventh heaven, you'd made the grade. You were in perfect happiness. Now, seven is the number of perfection in the, in the scriptures. So here we have seven levels of heaven. Now, how many levels of hell do you think there were? Somebody want to guess? Seven. A balance. There's always a balance. Now, if the seventh level of heaven was the place of perfect joy and harmony and happiness, what was the seventh level of hell? Exactly opposite. Darkness, pain, fire, brimstone, agony. So Jews believed in seven levels of heaven and seven levels of hell. The seventh level of hell was called Gehenna. And the only difference between Jewish belief and our belief today is that the Jews believed that when a soul was relegated to Gehenna, it would only be there for 12 months, and then it would be annihilated. But Jesus himself comes on the, on the scene, and he says that Gehenna is everlasting fire. Everlasting. Two things Jesus changed. One is marriage, remember? He said, Moses allowed you to divorce because of the hardening of your hearts, but I tell you this. Well, he also changed this whole idea of Gehenna being a temporary state. And he says, Gehenna is everlasting fire. Now, what was the first level of hell? You remember the good thief on the cross? Tradition tells us his name was Dismas. And he looks over to Jesus and he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what does Jesus say? Today you'll be with me in paradise. Well, where was paradise? Many people would say, well, it was in heaven. But heaven wasn't open. Scripture tells us that heaven didn't open until 40 days later when Jesus ascended. Then he opened heaven. So what the heck? And then the Apostles' Creed says that Jesus descended to hell. Now why would Jesus go to hell? To preach to the damned? You know, to wag his finger at them and say, see, I told you, you should have been good. That's not what Jesus did. The first level of hell was called paradise, or the bosom of Abraham. You remember the story about Lazarus and the rich man? And Lazarus was outside the rich man's home, and, he had, and the dogs would come and lick his sores, and he didn't have anything to eat. And the rich man wasn't a bad guy, but he was rich, and he saw the needs of the people, but he blinded himself, and he didn't meet the needs of the people. You know, when Jesus said it's harder for a rich man to get into the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to, to go through the eye of a needle, he meant that literally. He's not talking about, uh, you know, he, he literally means harder for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Very, because rich men, the more that God gives them, they need to use that wealth for God. That's the key here. So Lazarus is in the bosom of Abraham. The rich man dies, and he goes to a place adjacent to the bosom of Abraham, or paradise. How do we know? Because he says he can see paradise. And the rich man says, Father Abraham, Father Abraham, wet my lips. He's in pain. He's thirsty. And Father Abraham says, can't do that. There's a gulf between us. Nothing can cross this gulf. The rich man says, well, then send Lazarus to my brothers. I don't want my brothers to end up here, is what he's saying. Send Lazarus to my brothers. Let them know. And Abraham says, well, wouldn't do any good. We sent the prophets, didn't listen to the prophets. What may they think? If somebody rises from the dead, they're going to believe. So we know that the rich man had love in his heart for his brothers. Can't be in Gehenna, can he? Because there's no love in Gehenna. The opposite of heaven, the seventh level of heaven. There's no love there, nothing but pain and hatred. Just as much love as there is in heaven, there's the antithesis of that in hell. So we know that the rich man was in a place adjacent. Jews believe that levels two through six were called purgatory, and that depending upon the state of a person's soul, if they were really bad, but they weren't bad enough to go to Gehenna, they would go to level six. And as they expiated their sins, they would gradually go from six to five to four to three to two. The paradise is no longer in existence. God, Jesus, when he went to heaven, emptied paradise and took all of those righteous souls with him to heaven. 
So here we have the whole doctrine of purgatory. It's not just found in the book of Maccabees. In the second book of Maccabees, chapter 12, verses 43 and following, we have a story about a man named Judas Maccabeus, and he's a Jewish king, and he's a righteous king, and he's in submission to the authority of God. And he goes into battle, and at the end of the battle, a number of his men are laid out on the battlefield, dead, slain. He doesn't really understand this, but time is short because the Sabbath was coming. And they had to stop the battle, if you will, and rather even than bury their men, they went to the city of Abdullam and they passed the Sabbath. And they cleansed themselves from this sin of war. And then they went back to bury their kinsmen in their ancestral tombs. And it tells us that underneath their tunics of the dead, they found an amulet sacred to the idol of Jamnia. Now, that would be tantamount to today saying, well, I trust in God, but just in case I'm going to carry a rabbit's foot. They didn't have total trust and confidence in God. So Judas recognizes this, and he praises God for revealing this to him. This is why these men died, and he tells his men, see, this is what happens when you're not in full submission to the one true God. You can't give God 90%. He wants 100%. We can't take, pick and choose, and I believe this, and I believe this, and I believe this, and I give God this part of my life, and this part of my life, and this part of my life, but this part over here, that's God's, none of God's business. That's hands off. This is my thing. Well, God doesn't work that way. God wants 100% of us. So Judas recognizes that, praises God, but he takes up a collection of money from his surviving soldiers, and he sends that to Jerusalem to offer an expiatory sacrifice for the sins of those men who had fallen. Now, if you don't understand the term expiatory, this crucifix illustrates it, the perfect expiatory sacrifice. An expiatory sacrifice is one that somebody does for the sake of another. So he took this 2,000 silver drachmas, 2,000 days wages, sends it to Jerusalem to offer prayer and sacrifice for the souls of the dead. Now, the doctrine of purgatory, like I said, goes back 4,000 years. Same thing with the doctrine of indulgences. Let me touch on that. Do I have time to touch on that? Okay. About three weeks ago, I was talking to a group of 60 young kids, teenagers, confirmation class. And I asked him, I said, it was the day before Yom Kippur. And I said, uh, can anybody tell me what tomorrow is? And I didn't expect an answer. But a, a young girl in the third row said, it's Yom Kippur. And I said, well, what's Yom Kippur? Does anybody know what Yom Kippur is? They said, it's the Day of Atonement. I said, fine, okay. What's the Day of Atonement? Can anybody tell me? And naturally, they were silent. They had heard about it, but nobody knew anything about it. So I talked about the Day of Atonement and how the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies. And as I mentioned previously, he offered 15 sacrifices during the day. Ten of them were in the main part of the temple, but five of them were in the Holy of Holies. And in order for the high priest to enter the Holy of Holies, he had to bathe completely. Each time he went into the Holy of Holies, he bathed completely, and he put on a seamless white garment that had never been worn before and would never be worn again. And attached to the hem of the garment were bells. So whenever the high priest walked in the Holy of Holies, they would hear the bells tinkling. And he also walked in with a rope tied around him. We don't know exactly where, maybe around his waist or around his leg. Because when he walked into the Holy of Holies, if he wasn't perfectly pure in mind, heart, spirit, and physically, God would strike him dead right there. And the bells would stop ringing, and they used the rope to pull the body out. All right? Now, this had half to, now we have no record of this happening, but it must have happened at one time or another, because otherwise they wouldn't have had the rope. There's another story in 2 Samuel where David is transporting the Ark of the Covenant. And if you remember the story, the oxen stumbled, and Uzzer, the priest, reaches up and he touches the Ark of the Covenant, and God killed him for touching it. The profane had come into contact with the sacred. So when the high priest walked into the Holy of Holies, he was very well aware that he was coming into God's house. Now, the modern-day equivalent to the Holy of Holies is where we are right now, where the tabernacle of God is.
Keep this in mind the next time you come into a church, or keep it in mind the way you dress when you come into church. You're coming in to the Holy of Holies, and everything, our whole mind, our spirit, our thoughts, everything must be geared to Jesus in the tabernacle and in the sacrifice of the Mass and receiving the worthy reception of the Holy Eucharist. So the Jews believed on Yom Kippur that they first day, the first day of the Jewish New Year was called Rosh Hashanah. It literally means the head of the year. And 10 days later is Yom Kippur. And Jews believe that God evaluates them every year during these 10 days. They were called the Days of Awe. It was called the Feast of Expiation. Or it's also called the High Holy Days. And they believe that God judged them on, number one, how well they lived their life, whether or not they were sorrowful and repentant for sins, and thirdly, whether or not they made a firm purpose of amendment. In other words, I'm going to change this behavior. And they believed that God found them worthy. He would write their name in the book of life and they would live and prosper for another year. But the Jews, as I mentioned, believed in the seven levels of heaven. And they also believed that their ancestors, their righteous ancestors, were before the throne of God. So what the Jews would do would be to go to the tombs of their ancestors and they would ask their ancestors to intercede for them before the throne of God. Now, if that's not the communion of saints, I don't know what is. So the communion of saints is not something that the Catholic Church invented. It's something that goes back part and parcel 4,000 years. The Jews asked them to intercede. Now, if God decided to allow this intercession, how would God benefit them, if you will. Now, God could do whatever God wanted, but Jews believed that the patriarchs of old had stored up a treasury of merit. Let me try to explain this. Number one, you can't work your way into heaven, right? Heaven's a free gift. So in order to understand the doctrine of indulgences, you have to understand the doctrine of grace. And we have two types of grace. We have actual grace, and we have sanctifying grace. Two different concepts. Actual grace, we can go back to St. Augustine. And St. Augustine said that for any beneficial act that we perform, it's God working in and through us to perform that act. In other words, if we died and stood before Jesus, we can't say to Jesus, well, look, I, I clothed the naked and I fed the sick and I did this and I did that. He's going to say, no, you didn't. I did that. I used you, but I did it. So we can't claim how good we are. But Augustine put it this way, God, say for instance you see somebody, and I can't imagine that here in Florida, but maybe it's some cold night and you're driving past a, a liquor store, in the back of the liquor store you see a guy with a bottle of wine in his hand and he's passed out. And you drive by that liquor store and you look at this guy and say, look at that stupid idiot. He's going he's to die if he stays out there. And you go on your way. And during the night, sure enough, the guy dies. Are you culpable? Yeah, you're culpable. In other words, you're partially responsible for that man's death because the Holy Spirit brought that man to your attention. But you elected because of your free will not to do anything about it. But if you elected to do something about it, then the Holy Spirit will empower you to do it. It's called the will and the performance. So the Holy Spirit nudges us, prompts us, we can accept or reject. If we accept, then the Holy Spirit supports us and enables us to do this. That's actual grace. Now, when we do these things and we're in total submission to the Holy Spirit, we gain merit. And merit is what expiates our sins. Now, how do we gain merit? Now, it's not like a scale of justice, rather, that if my good works outside outweigh my bad works, I go to heaven. Remember, heaven's a free gift, but we have to pay for our sins. You remember the story of David and Bathsheba? David looks over the back fence, he sees his beautiful babe Bathsheba, he desires her, so what happens, he brings her into his household, he gets her pregnant, but she's married to one of his generals, he calls the general back from war, he said he's hoping that the general, his name is Uriah, now Uriah's going to sheep with Bathsheba, then he's off the hook, but the general doesn't sleep with his wife because he believed that if he had sexual intercourse with his wife, it would deplete his virility and it would make him vulnerable in war. So he doesn't sleep with his, war, uh, his wife, and now David's got a problem. So he sends Uriah back into war, and he makes sure Uriah is killed. And later on, what happens? 
Nathan the prophet comes to David and he tells him this story about a man who said, this is this rich man over here, and this rich man had everything he wanted. He had sheep and cattle and oxen, and you know, he had everything he could possibly want, and many, many wives. But there was this man over here who had one little sheep. And this man loved this little lamb so much that he even had the lamb eat at his table. But the rich man wanted the lamb, so he had the man killed, and then he took the lamb. And David said, well, the man who did that should be put to death. And Nathan said, that's what you did. You took Bathsheba. And David repents before God and begs forgiveness. And Nathan the prophet says, God has put aside your sin, but in reparation, he's going to take the life of your firstborn son. And a week later, David's son dies. Now this is just one indication. Uh, Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. They were forgiven, but they had to live a life of generations upon generations of privation. They had to work for their food. They were forgiven, but they still had to pay a penalty. So even though through the sacramental action of the confess, confessor, then our sins are forgiven, but we still have to make it right. And if we don't make it right in this world, we have to make it right in the next world. One, one or the other. So the Jews believed, getting back to this whole idea, that the patriarchs, the righteous of old, had built up a treasury of merit far beyond what they needed to expiate their own sins. Like Mother Teresa. Can any of you here imagine that Mother Teresa did not live a life of sanctity, prayer, and help of others? She didn't care what color you were or what your status in life. She looked at every person and said, this is Jesus. So Mother Teresa built up a treasury of merit so far exceeding what would be necessary for her to expiate her own sins. Well, does that, all of that merit go to waste? No, it doesn't. It goes into the treasury of merit. And the treasury of merit, that term, is not Catholic. The Jews called it the treasury of merit. And they believed that the merit that had been stored up on the part of all the righteous Jews from the beginning of time could be applied to them. So they would beg their ancestors to go before the throne of God and ask God to intercede and that God would apply the merit of the righteous to them. Now the only difference between us and Catholic, Catholic belief and Jewish belief is the fact that we believe that the treasury of merit became inexhaustible with the life of Mary, her fiat, and also the sacrifice of Jesus, our brother, so all of that merit is just there, and it's inexhaustible. And through the power of the keys of the kingdom, where Jesus in Matthew 16, 16 uh, uh, 18, Jesus gives Peter the keys of the kingdom. And part of that whole idea of the keys of the kingdom, when he was giving him authority, he was giving them the authority to heaven. If you go back into Isaiah 22, 22, we have a story there that a man was given the keys of the kingdom. And he was given an actual wooden key that was worn on his shoulder as a sash to signify the badge of office. And it, whatever, in the absence of the king, he was in charge. And he was in charge of the security of the, of the kingdom. He was literally there to lock the gates at night and open them in the morning. He was responsible for everybody who was allowed in or out of the kingdom. Why do you think Jesus says to Peter, he says, Peter, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. And Peter says, whoa, wait a minute, time out here. Don't go to Jerusalem. Because Peter understands what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is saying, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be lifted up. I'm going to be crucified. And I'm putting you in charge. And here's this humble fisherman saying, hey, don't go, don't go. Can you imagine if you were in that situation, would you want Jesus to go? You know, the church is, they say that the, the strongest chain is only as good as its weakest link. Peter was the weakest link. And if Peter was the weakest link, that's why the church is so strong today. So this whole idea of indulgences is not something that we invented. It goes part and parcel back into Juda Judaism 4,000 years. So Luther denies the doctrine of purgatory, which is found in 2 Maccabees. He denies free will, which I said is found in Sirach. But he can't just pull these two books out of the Bible. So what does Luther do? He literally throws out the entire canon of Scripture. And he accepted the Jewish canon of Scripture that was put together at the end of the first century. Now he took the seven books that were contested and he called them apocryphal. And the word apocryphal means false or spurious. It has a couple of other meanings, but for our purposes, they, he considered them false books. And he sandwiched them between the Old and the New Testament. And he said they were worthy of study, but they were not divinely inspired. 
Finally, in 1826, they were removed from all Protestant Bibles because it was simpler and cheaper to publish a book without them. So essentially, this is why there's a difference between the Catholic Bible today and the Protestant Bible. If you can see, if you believe in prayer for the dead and you believe in free will, it shows that this whole doctrine in Protestantism of once saved, always saved, this whole idea of sola scriptura, that the Bible and the Bible alone is the sole rule of faith, it all falls apart. Even in Augustine's time, Augustine would say, first of all, we go to the scriptures. And Augustine said, I would not believe in the authority of the scriptures, or I would not believe in the scriptures except because of the authority of the church. So when Augustine wanted to argue a particular premise, he would first go to the scriptures. And he would say, this is, now how do we know that this, our interpretation of Scripture is correct? Then he would go into the early writings of the Fathers, which is something that we've been doing for 2,000 years. So the whole di idea of sola scriptura, that the Bible and the Bible alone is the sole rule of faith, the whole idea of sola fide, which means that faith and faith alone is all that's necessary. So there's a lot of people here, unfortunately, who are not Catholic, who have a limited view of, of the Bible. They don't have all the information they need. And as a result of that, we now have thousands and thousands of Christian denominations out there, each of them using the same foundation of the Scriptures and saying, my interpretation of the Scriptures is this, and I can say, well, my interpretation is over here. We're both claiming the authority of the same Holy Spirit, and yet we can't come to agreement. So there's anywhere between 22,000, they say, to maybe as many as 28,000 Christian denominations, and each one of them claim their authority in the Bible. Long before the Bible ever existed, there was the church. And the church is the pillar and foundation of truth. Scripture tells us that. So this whole idea, I think it's incumbent upon us as Catholics to understand that the Bible is a Catholic book. It was written by Catholics for Catholics. In a sense, you could say, that, well, we own the copyright. It's our book. We need to be familiar with the Bible. Not just the New Testament, but the Old Testament. And if you read the New Testament and then you study the Old Testament, you'll see it all come alive. But this is a book of the church. That's what the scripture is all about, a collection of books. But it's not only that we have, which I'm going to talk about in the next presentation, we have the authority of the church and we have the early writings of the church called the fathers or the, the patristic study, the study of the early writings of the church.